Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is always a conversation with my friends. And I have here today with me, as usual, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. You can call me Cassie today. I feel oh very Cassie like. Oh, <laughs> oh, I love that you have an affinity for Cassie. And yes, what I is it that we're going to talk about today, Landon? We're going to talk about the hottest show on HBO right now, Game of Thrones, step to the side, it's Euphoria. <laughs> yes, we're going to talk about Euphoria. So a couple of things before we get started. Um, we are focused on season one during this stream. Next stream, we're going to be talking more about Euphoria because guess what? There's more than two hours of stuff to say about Euphoria. That is how like impactful it is. However, we will be touching on season two. And like, for example, when we do our plot summary, the plot summary is going to cover both seasons. Um, so this is also a note to YouTube viewers who are watching after the fact. You can use the timestamps below to skip ahead if you really want to get to the meat. Since this is a stream, I recommend skipping to the Why High School section. That'll get you past the, the favorite things and the hellos and the plots. I'm you all that streamer stuff. Um, but let's actually, let me switch over so you guys can see, so you guys can see the PowerPoint. Here we go. There we go. Euphoria. Oh Euphoria God. part one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I also wanted to mention that uh, our deep dives when we start doing characters will also include season two spoilers. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that takes us to our content warning. Uh, Enter Stage Window is not a spoiler free stream. The str this stream right here right now will contain spoilers for both season one and season two of Euphoria. So if you haven't watched season two, you're living under a rock, you don't want to be spoiled, get on that and then come back and watch the VOD. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also, Euphoria contains underage drinking, drug use, sex, all kinds of violent and horny things. And we're going to be discussing them, okay? We're going to not yeah. only be discussing that, we're going to be discussing toxic relationships, uh, issues of self-identification, societal expectations. There's going to be, you know, LGBTQ stuff that comes up. I mean, it's literally everything that you can think of that might get content warning for. It's in Euphoria. I think, like, the only thing yeah. Euphoria doesn't tackle is maybe, like eating disorders that's it everything else like it's there so like content warnings all dead dove do not eat okay we told you now you know <laughs> euphoria feels like the kitchen have you ever heard of the term like kitchen sink soup? yeah 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 mm -hmm. it's the kitchen sink soup of horny tv shows yes that's what euphoria is it has literally everything literally everything <laughs> literally like it's it's dead dove do not eat the tv show i mean if you think game of thrones is dead dove no euphoria is dead dove okay like that's what it is dead that's is what it is <laughs> uh but before we get started let us do what we do every single stream talk about our favorite things so karen what's your favorite thing about euphoria okay my favorite thing about euphoria is the same thing that captured like a euphoria fandom when the season one first came out and that is the fashion so this is so early 2000s right like everything in euphoria is giving me like 2001 to 2005 vibes it's so over the top it's so sparkly it's so extra and it's like you know everyone shows their belly um you know everyone dyes their hair everyone shops at hot topic before hot topic became fandom and i just i just freaking love it okay i just freaking love it everyone single character in this show except for rue dresses like the cool quirky girl at your school okay they all do it and it's all great and i'm here for it i'm here for the clothes the makeup the hair all of it okay it's my dream i love it it is i okay so someone who loves a good bold eye uh i am so happy when euphoria came out because i was just like <laughs> the bright makeup is back we like went a little neutral for a few years and i stayed with the hot pinks and now we're back mm -hmm. um and i also do believe the show single-handedly brought y2k fashion back Oh my 100%. God, I agree. I agree. Like if it didn't bring it back, it like happened to hop on the trend at the same time that all the Zoomers were like, oh, I wish I lived in 1999, I, you know? See, here's, like, here's, <laughs> I don't think any, like any like Gen Zers were watching Euphoria because we'll talk about this. Euphoria is not for them. However, I do think that they then saw it blow up and was like, that's cool. That's, Cause, that's, that's cool. And then took it and ran with yes, it. Yes. Cause and there was all these like, back there was all these like Instagram trends of like euphoria makeup or whatever, yeah. um, which was fabulous because it was the one and only excuse at the time to play with makeup during the pandemic, which I don't know if you guys have noticed, but aside from the euphoria trends, like makeup has kind of taken a dip 
in in the pandemic since we're not leaving the house anymore we're not buying as much in addition it feels like we're not watching as much like makeup instagram and makeup youtube and stuff like that like we're really into like more about um you know gardening or home decor or things like that not so much about makeup and clothes yeah except for the euphoria types the travel youtube hole is the hole that i fell down to during the pandemic and it was all old stuff Mm -hmm. uh but it was trying to get travel while I was stuck at home. <laughs> yes, Kitty, welcome, welcome. But there was not new travel content, right? Like I definitely noticed that. I just had well, to kind of rewatch. Like van life, there was like van life stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the, the DIY, buy a van, turn it into a house and go camping in the middle of nowhere blew up trend during the yeah. pandemic. But that like that was it. That was the only traveling that was like new content. Everything else was like rewatching old content. Yeah, I agree. So that was my favorite part of Euphoria. And I just have to say, like, in addition to this, um, something that uh, that we'll, we'll probably talk about here and there, but a lot of other um, people that have talked about Euphoria have focused on it. So we're not going to focus on it too much, which is like the absolutely amazing, mind blowing cinematography, lighting, everything, sound design of this show. Like it is like. It is like so um, overwhelming to the senses. And so I just have to say that like, I was so enthralled visually with this show and this, the fashion is like kind of where that, that took me. But um, to the point that when I watched the first couple of episodes, cause I, cause as y'all know, Landon builds the PowerPoints for these, which means I take a bunch of notes so that she can see them and see my thoughts kind of before we get into that. And she looked at my doc for the first like three episodes and there was barely any notes. And she was like worried that I didn't like the show. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. I am just so like visually overwhelmed that I can't write while I'm watching it. <laughs> I, I, I was very concerned because I was like, it's two seasons and if you don't like it, we will find something else. <laughs> I also don't want to tear this show apart because I really like it. Yeah. And now we do have criticisms, <laughs> of course. I mean, y'all know how it is. We do have criticisms, of course. I don't, I, I, I have some, I have thoughts on the show, but overall, like overall, it's a good show. You guys, there's a reason it got popular. You know what I'm I saying? I just put you through Hamilton. I didn't want to have to put you through that again. I'm like, <laughs> a kind friend. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I did find things I liked about Hamilton, you know. Yeah, you definitely, we definitely compromised on that one. Yes. No, and, I, and just to hit on the cinema, cinematography, because we don't have a specific thing there. One of my favorite things about this show is that it really does feel like it's being told through Rue's eyes depending on where she is in her sobriety. So like the cinematography, the color, how much color there is, how much is going on really falls through with how much stimulants she is on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that is really connected and really like thoughtful of the showmakers, especially in season one. Yeah, I think it you can definitely see it in season one for sure. And it's in the visual part of the storytelling. So just to be clear, because we're going to talk about the story story, like the writing of it later, um, probably next next week. But um, but uh, yeah, we're talking in the visual part of the story. That is absolutely the case. Yeah. All right. So that's my favorite thing. What's your favorite thing, Landon? Oh, my God. So this made me laugh so hard. And it just was this it was a beautiful true what felt true to life moment which was kind of hard to find in euphoria a little bit like, <laughs> incredibly, incredibly cleverly written well acted and beautifully delivered was rue's dick pic speech uh she runs an entire seminar on how to correct and judge a dick pic and when i say that i've had these conversations with my friends i've had these conversations with my friends <laughs> And I've heard some of this criticism before. And it's just, it was just such a funny, lighthearted, fucking funny scene that really let us see this character, but also let us see the humor and appreciate what was happening with this show. And also, when is the last time on a major show that we have seen men be completely basically judged by their parts uh, in such a way that it doesn't feel like it's a man doing it because they want to make it feel equal. Like this is definitely <laughs> made it feel like, Hey, this, the point of this is not to sexualize them. It's to humiliate them. And I loved it. <laughs> there is overall so much dick in this show. You guys like so much dick. If you like to see dick, this, you for just like, like, even if you don't like the other parts of Euphoria, I promise you there is so much dick in there that you will be entertained, thoroughly yeah. entertained. <laughs> As someone who, like, is very, you know, on the lesbian side of everything, there's a lot of dick. But also, you're <laughs> really used to it, and it just becomes part of the background. 
I mean, I mean, honestly, like, if I think about, like, the scenes that really visually arrested me so hard, it was the dick scenes. Like, it's the locker room scene that where Nate's talking about how he feels about seeing other guys junk. It's the um, the scene that Kat has where, like, all of the, the men, um, you know, the Dothraki or whatever, I, I think they're supposed to be Dothraki, um, but they can't, they can't say that they are, of course. But they're, they're, like, running at her, you know, all enthralled by her. And there's just, like, there's just, like, so much. There's just, like, and this was one of the funniest scenes. Like, the show has these random kind of asides, which, you know, it, there's stuff to say about that that... I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure kind of overall why they're in the show. However, I really appreciate them when they happen because they're freaking hilarious. And this is a great example of one of those. Yeah. There again, insights into Rue. Like it, it makes it obvious in season one that Rue is the storyteller because these things happen. This particular one happened because Rue was manic. Mm-hmm. She was manic before she crashed. So she was very much up, up, up and like, let's do a weird thing and take the entire audience aside and give them a five minute lecture on how to take a dick pic. Yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, and it's great because it's in the, it's in the context of, um, you know, dick pics that, uh, that Jules is getting from, from this guy and, uh, and Rue's trying to like figure out like if this is a guy worth pursuing or whatever. And they don't really know much about him except for these dick pics. So... <laughs> Yeah, no, it was fantastic. It was mm-hmm. fantastic. Uh, so and then good. I stole, and then also here's the other thing is that I stole this bit uh for a D game that Karen and I play, and our DM gave me inspiration for it. Mm-hmm. So it was great. <laughs> that's <another laughs> why I love this part. I got to steal the joke and get inspiration for it. <laughs> and it was hilarious when you did it. It really was. So <laughs> All right, but shall we go on to the meat of the subject? Yes, okay, so now as we like to do, we're going to do a plot summary. Um, as usual with TV shows, this is kind of a challenge because in a TV show with, with a ensemble-esque cast, it's hard to do, but Landon's going to do her best to take us through the major events of season one and season two. So that being said, take it away, Landon. The audience is transported to a modern-day suburban school outside of Los Angeles County where we find the story of Rue, a 16-year-old drug addict who has just been released from rehab, but sobriety is not part of the plan. Rue makes it very clear from the beginning that she has no intention of ever being sober again. That is, until Jules walks into her life. Jules is a 16-year-old transfer student, and she is suffering from her own baggage, including a relationship with her femininity as a post-top surgery trans woman, and a mother who is absent due to addiction as well. Rue and and Jules fall into a codependent relationship as they search for the answers of their unknowable life within one another. But of course, as all good things do, the honeymoon period ends and the truth of what it is to be in love with an addict rocks the both of them. Jules demands sobriety and Rue, Rue is unable and unwilling to meet her demands. The emotion, the emotion rocking love story that has ups and downs, relapse, lies, enabling that leaves us at the end of this season two separated for good for the both of them. However, it is important to note that this show is not just about Rue and Jules. Even though she plays the omniscient storyteller, we also follow the story of her friends. Uh, one, not her friend. I wrote this wrong. Anyway, Nate the violent boy whose goal is to live the perfect life that his father had failed to provide him, especially because he consider- continues to watch the porn his father makes. As, uh, as his, and his on and off again girlfriend, Maddie, Maddie's relationship continues to circle the drain. It gets more and more toxic, including de- acts of domestic violence, blackmail, and codependency like no other. Maddie's best friend Kat struggles with body acceptance and turns into a hypersexualization version of herself to make up for the fact that she is fat. She finds a niche spot on this an online cam girl for work until she meets a boy who loves her for her. But soon enough, that isn't enough. And Kat finds herself just as unhappy as before, even though she has a boyfriend she doesn't like. Cass are... Maddie's other friend Cass and Rue's best friend Lexi are sisters whose father went MIA after falling into a drug addict uh, addiction. Both girls are desperate to find their happiness. Lexi with fading into the background and Cassie with any boy that says that they love her. In season one, it's McKay, a charming college boy who wants to uphold the expectations of his future 
uh, but is meant, but is meant to be the future that is meant to be, but cares more about how other people see him than how he sees himself. Cassie and McKay quickly fall in and out of love, leaving Cassie heartbroken with some seemingly no one else to turn to, but Maddie's at the time ex-boyfriend Nate. The circle of cycle of domestic bliss to chaos spins again. And Lexi spends the majority of the time observing the world and enabling the brokenness of other people, mostly Rue, who takes advantage of it. But finally in season two, she takes her power back by writing and putting on a play based on her and her friends' lives to finally be able to tell the story of her own. And that is the very broad outcome of what is Euphoria. <laughs> yes, okay, so so to make sure that it's clear, um, the main characters are really Rue and Jules, and then you've yep. got Rue's old best friend, Lexi, and Lexi has a sister named Cassie, and Cassie's best friend is Maddie, and then there's Nate, and there's this kind of like love triangle subplot between Cassie, Maddie, and Nate. But there's also a love triangle subplot in season one between Maddie, Jules, and Nate as yes. well, because Nate is playing a secret person. We will get into the actual details of the, all the crazy chaos that happens because not only is this like visually stimulating TV show, a lot of shit happens <laughs> like so much that it's hard to think about even talking about it. Yep. So if you think about like every crazy story you've ever heard, like from high school, you know, any, any kind of crazy story, well, they all happen within the span of like one year at this one high school in this Los Angeles suburb. That's basically yeah. euphoria. <laughs> Which is crazy because when we're thinking about this show, Mm-hmm. And we're thinking about, hey, HBO, which is an adult content streaming platform at this point, uh, is putting on a show about high schoolers. We have to ask the question, why high school? Yeah, why high school why indeed? High school? Why high school? Uh, and that's something that we kind of want to dig into because I think it, it, it led to some confusion Mm-hmm. within fans and also within the media of like romanticizing underage chaos like this but there's also a de- like a deliberate choice by the showrunners to do this because like we said before this show was not meant for gen zers who are the high schoolers right now to watch this yeah. isn't for them so but it is about them. so a couple of things with this that i want to make sure is clear um this show is for adults okay it is not for under 18 people right so so older gen zers are going to be old enough to be watching this show but if you're underage highly recommend not to watch this show if you're easily triggered highly recommend not to watch this show right it's just not like that so a lot of the discourse online especially on twitter became like oh, this show is um, is sexualizing or fetishizing high schoolers. And I don't think that's what the show is doing. So we're going to talk about why is this high school? And I want to say, welcome in Blue Island, broaden the demographic. I don't know. I mean, Zendaya even tweeted herself. She's a star as a star of the show. And she even tweeted like, kids don't watch. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. <laughs> this season, mostly because children were watching i mean she's a disney she was a disney star so her fandom grew up with her and when she got into into this Mm -hmm. uh her fandom was kind of still too young to be watching it and they all did watch it and then their parents threw a fucking fit Mm -hmm. they told Um, kids not to watch degrassi (laughs) degrassi's way tame compared to euphoria but yeah so the first the first reason the first reason that we have about why high school is because um it's a heightened sense of emotion. So as somebody that is older now, right, I'm 35, and I think back to my high school time, which was the early 2000s, you know, exactly the fashion that they've got in this show. So, you know, this was made by a 30-something about their childhood experience. I am a 30-something watching it, remembering my childhood experience. I can confidently say that it captures the emotion of what it's like in high school. Because if you think about how you felt at that time, um, everything was so heightened, right? Like when you're that age, you think everything is so important. You know, it's all about like, 
Um, it's all about like, oh, these things are going to affect me forever. These decisions are like going to affect me forever. And everything feels like so raw and real. You know, when you're in high school, you've typically just gone through like the beginnings of puberty and you are in your like inc most incredibly pubescent part of your life where everything is about figuring yourself out everything is about you know who you're friends with everything is about who you're hooking up with you know and everything feels so much more so how do you make an adult feel like they did in high school you gotta ramp it up because if you had real high school drama i'm watching i would be watching this and be like y'all this is stupid because if i look back to the things i thought were important when i was 15 y'all that shit was stupid <laughs> You know? Well, yeah, I mean, Blue Eyed makes a good point as far as like it being like, we were worried about our grades, but at that point in time, grades were everything, mm -hmm. right? We were, I mean, for, for the typical American white um, experience, you were going to call, you were going to high school, you were trying to get good grades so that you could get into a good college so you could set yourself up successfully for life. That is what society was pushing us to do mm -hmm. which meant that every grade mattered which means every test mattered which meant every relationship mattered we started making adult decisions in high schools whether we realized them or not they certainly felt like adult decisions uh and we were basically told that right now you is the stepping stones of your future for the rest of your life these are the decisions that matter and then also being told at the same time that like we're just kids so there's a level of angst there of being like, we're making important adult decisions that we're being told are important adult decisions, but they're also being undermined as, as just us being kids. So like, which one is it? And that, that ups the level of angst that we all naturally felt at that age. And that was the underline of like what society was telling us. It's not even the personal issues we were going through. That's not even the trauma that our families were putting us through. That's nothing. <laughs> That's just literally existing at that age. Yep. Yep. And we just thought, we just thought everything was so, so important, even if it really wasn't. And so, you know, in euphoria, if you want a 35 year old to feel like these things are important, you have to have actually important things. So hence you get this situation where these high schoolers are playing out every um, heightened possible drama where in real life in high school, like maybe one or two of these things you knew someone that they happened to but like all this stuff didn't happen within like this small group within like the span of one year because between season one and two it is basically a year because the first season ends with the homecoming dance right and then we pick back up um seemingly after christmas break i don't know i'm kind of assuming because the season it's not clear in season two um and uh, and you kind of play out some of the events of that semester, but I'm not even quite sure if they make it all the way to summer. Like it's unclear, but it seems that way. This final thing basically says that for the rest of the year she stays sober, and through that summer she stays sober. So we're kind of hinting that the next season won't take place until later. So yeah. yes, we kind of know the outcome of that year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, big plays are usually in the springtime. So and then the bridge episodes took place over the course of Christmas vacation. Yes. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think that this is over the course of one, not a little, only full year, one school year. Yeah. One school year. Exactly. One school exactly. Year. Yep. Um, so yeah, you have to have those heightened emotions and how you make adults feel heightened emotions is giving them scenarios that they're familiar with, but also giving them scenarios in which they can relate to. Mm -hmm. So even though these are high schoolers, their decisions are adult decisions. They are talking about drugs. They're talking about sex. They're talking about high stakes things that high schoolers do sometimes interact with. But for the most part, adults will have more context to and understand the actual seriousness of the things that they are grappling with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, for sure. So, so why high school? Like, because if this was in college, these things would just feel tragic okay but because it's in high school and we know as adults watching it that this is literally just there to play on our, our emotions that all of these things aren't happening to one group of high schoolers within one year you can put yourself in this clear fantasy like nobody watches this and thinks it's real instead you're just able to have that very cathartic emotional reaction and um and really fall into the show whereas if it was set in college 
it would feel a little bit too real and then it would be a lot harder to kind of fall into it. And there's a really good example of this that happens in the show. So in season two, we get an episode and we get a storyline around Cal, who is Nate's father. And some of the, because some of the things that Cal does in season one, basically um, we find out that he goes and sleeps with people around town, films it, and then keeps it. And he has this crazy code so that no one can figure it out. Yeah, and one of the people he sleeps with is Jules, who he finds out later, oops, she's underaged. And um, and the narrative cannot like just let cannot let that go, right? Cal needs to be punished for that. I assume that's what they decided in the writer's room that led them to actually have a Cal episode. So they have a they have a Cal episode. And because he's an adult, like watching him stumble around drunk, watching him get angry and and just drive crazy, like there it, it feels too real um so then you can't just kind of fall into a fantasy like for me anyway the cal episode even though i liked it like it took me out of it and it's because i couldn't connect emotionally the way i could with the high school characters where like it was very clear it wasn't real but like cal stuff i'm like i don't know man like that could actually really for real happen to somebody and they could go through that and it just felt too real what cal's episode did for me was connect him to nate more yeah we saw the similarities more so than we ever had before between father and son mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah again it it was like i'm not here to watch cal i'm here to watch 16 year olds <laughs> talk about their lives mm -hmm. um <laughs> no I, I i also think that there is a let if this took place during college subconsciously there is a level of choice there right you choose to go to college you're living on your own, you're an adult, you're making choices. In high school, you're kind of forced in your situation. And that kind of ties into something else we're gonna talk about here in a second. But as far as like, that these, these students, we meet these characters at the ends of their arc. And it's like, we're waiting for those next steps. And in those waiting, that's when chaos is, uh, like happens. Mm -hmm. When they're still playing adult, but forced into that role of high schoolers, that's when we see all the chaos and meet all of this, of all of this, like, tragedy and devastation. Yes. Um, so that, like, that also gives us there is that they're forced to be there. They're mm -hmm. forced to go to school. Whereas if this took place in college, they would just be making choices yeah. that then would have bad consequences, but those consequences are of their own making. Whereas these aren't, if that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, and we also know as adults looking back that the stuff you did in high school is actually totally irrelevant to how your life goes. Like, that's just true. Like, <laughs> the choice, you can totally screw up high school and pick yourself back up later. And like, yes, you might have to work a little extra harder, but you can totally do that and you'll, you'll be fine. You know, you'll be fine by the time you're 30, right? Um, for the most part. And, and, and that's just not as true in college. Like the stuff that you do in college and the habits that you form in college are much longer lasting um, throughout your life. And, uh, and so it would just feel a lot more devastating to watch these characters go through these things in a college age, whereas they're going through it in a high school age. And it's like, they got time to fix it. Like, they're gonna be okay. It's cool. Like, it's cool. You don't, you can like feel the emotion without like it feeling real and panicky. So yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's that emotion, that heightened level of emotion and that kind of feeling of stuckness. <laughs> Landon, you in the chat. Okay, so yes, adults can separate fantasy from reality, but sometimes it's like really difficult. And like, if you read too much Twitter, you'll start to believe that adults can't separate fantasy from reality. But the truth is, most people can. Normies can. Like, <laughs> also, like the the goal of a showrunner or a writer or a creative is to make it so it's harder to separate it. Because remember that art is supposed to inspire feelings yeah. feelings keep more connected so what a showrunner is trying to do in a show like euphoria is connect you to what is happening on stage or mm -hmm. on screen how they do that is they make it feel emotional and real your yeah. brain cannot tell it can't tell the difference of what is happening to you physically and like actually happening to you and what you are feeling is happening to you mm -hmm same reactions regardless so absolutely on a logical level adults can separate what is happening in real life versus what is happening 
on a, a screen or in a book or a TV show or a movie, but physiologically and like hormonally, your brain and body cannot tell the difference. Yeah. And that is true. something that is crazy. And that is why people get super invested into the shows that they like. Mm-hmm. And that's why, um, especially because, you see, that's why, especially you see people that are yeah. in that kind of like early twenties stage seem to have a lot of trouble separating it. <laughs> yeah. it's like that level of like, you can still be viscerally upset about something that is happening, even if you know it is not real. Yeah. If you've ever walked away from a TV show because you've cried or that you're upset or you're like, man, I really need to find out what happens next. That is because your body is reacting to mm -hmm. the emotional process that you just went through. Yeah. So and you, what's, guess you can, but no, you can't. Yeah. And what's <laughs> different about adults is that we know that like, oh, it's just a TV show. So I'm not going to actually react on what my body is feeling. I'm not going to go yeah. actually try to ruin someone's day over it. <laughs> uh, some people can't do that and <laughs> you're still left with those feelings you're still left with that thing so that, I think that that is a important thing to consider when we're watching a show like this yeah is that you are going through those those roller coaster of emotions and that makes you feel all of those things that you are feeling and it makes you inside the world even more mm -hmm. and I think so I think that that's probably good for emotion so there's another big thing about why high school and why this show like it really struck people and felt so good. And that is like, what is happening in this show is high verisimilitude. So let me explain what I mean by high verisimilitude. It's Very beautiful. Quickly, I was going to say, Karen just like dropped this word in our pre, in our pre like talk about what we're going to talk about. And I was just like, man, I need to get a definition. That's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great word. Okay. Because you watch this show and you, and you might feel like, wow, this is so realistic. But when you actually break down the plot, like, no, it's freaking not. It is not realistic to get a group of like six teenagers and all of this stuff happens to them within a year. That is not realistic. So what makes you feel like it's realistic and what makes you say that it's realistic is that it has high verisimilitude. So verisimilitude is the ability for a piece of fiction to make you feel like it's real. So it's kind of like, it's this feeling of real, not like, really real. And I think that what makes Euphoria have such high verisimilitude is in a couple of things. And I, I want to talk about why I chose this screenshot first. So tell me how many high schoolers in 2022 are going to the mall, are going to the roller rink, are, you know, showing their bellies like it's 2001. Okay. Oh, that one? Maybe that, that one. one. That one. <laughs> a lot <laughs> but what teenagers are going to the mall nowadays they're not when they're they're hanging out with their friends by texting each other right you know or at they're, their houses. <laughs> yeah or they're hanging out at their houses or if they're a little bit younger maybe they're all like logging into roblox or fortnite or whatever the kids are playing these days i don't know um genshin impact maybe they're all logging into not genshin impact i don't the other, know the other two, yes not that one <laughs> <laughs> thank you landon landon always lets me know from her students like what they're actually doing i have no idea i'm just guessing based on what i see on twitter so this show visually as somebody that's like in their 30s like watching it i see them doing all these things it's like oh i did that i walked around the mall when i was in high school you know i had the the belly shirt when i was in high school i went to the roller rink when i was in high school like i have this really beautiful memory of going to the roller rink on a lot of um different weekends and and at the at the roller rink they had like an arcade in the back and so we would go in the arcade in the back and we would win tickets so that we could go because one of the cheapest ticket things that you could buy was like warheads, single warheads. They were like one or two tickets or something like that. So we go win a bunch of tickets and we'd spend them all on warheads. And then we would just like eat as many warheads as we could until we thought we were going to die. So, you know, I see like I see these kids like doing things like going to the roller rink and going to the mall. And I'm just like, oh, and even though they don't like talk about them all while they're there even though like it's just a setting you know it's just a setting but it makes me feel like oh this is real so there's that way in the visual and then there's another way so when landon was going through the summary you know she's talking about the summary of different characters and their particular journeys that they go on and that's the other thing about this show because it is an ensemble cast in season one Okay, season two kind of falls out of this. We'll talk about that in a second. But in season one, 
a lot of the characters go through different things, right? So no matter what your high school experience was like, what your issue was like, there's some character that you have gone through the same bullshit they have gone through and you can relate to that. So like maybe you relate to like um, Maddie's issues with uh, with the way that she stays with with Nate, even though um, he chokes her in 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 uh, in season one. Maybe you relate to like um, Cassie, who basically just tries to get what she wants through like looking really cute because she got boobs real fast, right? She's like gigantic boobs, and in high school that's like a currency, right? Maybe you relate to Cat becoming hypersexual when she realizes that there is a group of people out there who value fatness in a sexual way, and she can utilize that to make herself feel powerful, you know? <laughs> By the way, we just have to touch on very quickly: uh, the actress for Cat is not fat, and it is sad that we are considering that actress that yeah anyway she's she's a plus side she's a plus size model um but she's not that plus size like most plus size models you know what i'm saying they never have a fat face we'll talk about that we'll talk about cat in a second but yeah um and or maybe you maybe you had a drug problem in high school and so you relate to rue or maybe you were you were trans or had issues with your gender or sexuality so you relate to jules i mean jules is so um tortured by what she goes through with her gender and the way that her family reacts to that that she self-harms so maybe you relate to that aspect right like and I can just go on and on and on these are just off the top of my head I didn't even write notes I just wrote you know there's an emotional core for all the characters and like literally that's what I'm building off of in my notes but there's just so much in here you can find a character where at least a portion of their struggle is something that you're like I've been through that I know what that feels like I've been there before wow you know and, uh, and so these characters feel very real because there's at least one we can attach onto. Now, that being said, the other thing that gives this great verisimilitude is actually something that I think is detrimental to the writing. There's really no change in a lot of these characters. Who they are at the beginning is kind of who they still are at the end of season two. You know what I'm saying? Like the only character that really has an arc is Kat. Like she really is in a different spot at the beginning of season one versus the end of season one. And then unfortunately her character kind of falls by the wayside in season two. Um, but uh, but most of the others don't have any development. Exactly, um, Blue. They don't have any development, which gives it really high verisimilitude because these characters are really they're really like caricatures like cartoons of real people but that's what you want in a character like in a character you want the illusion of complexity not the actual complexity that real people have right so i'll stop talking for a second so landon can jump in because i have to keep i feel no. like i've been talking for a while <laughs> You're making such good points but no i agree with that as far as like the that we meet these characters at the end of their arcs, at the completion of the hard parts of their lives. Rue's father died. She fell into a drug addiction. She went to rehab. We meet her after rehab. That is the ending of that story. That is how that story is supposed to end. And that's where we meet her. Maddie fell in and out with Nate. And we kind of meet her in that same cycle. But again, that her, her parents are separated that uh, she's been through a lot of shit and she has found her Prince Charming. That's where we meet her. We meet Cassie at the, be at the beginning of her love story, but where we meet her, her and McKay are happy and falling in love and that is all that she's ever wanted. Um, and we meet Kat after having like basically already reached success as a writer and had adoring fans and was incredibly happy with who she was. Jules has already gone through transition and has been accept and accepted herself and who she was. And yes, she self-harmed, but she is now better and things are good. Like we meet these characters at their outcomes. Mm -hmm. and yeah, because we only see Jules self-harm once and then she really doesn't do it again. Um, so we see like the last time that she did, basically. That's the start of her character. Yes. And we meet them at the end of all of their growth and we get their stories through flashbacks which is a very interesting way of storytelling but what they are then put through is just a cycle of continuation of what's already happened um rue and we'll deep dive all of these but you know rue rue continues her struggle with sobriety uh and and lying about addiction that's a cycle 
Nate mm-hmm. and Maddie continue their cycle of, of a relationship. Cassie continues her cycle of, of finding codependency in anyone, whether it be any friend or any person. Um, you, you know, uh, Kat is never happy, no matter what successful landmark or benchmark that she's put for herself. As soon as she's reached it, she's not happy with it. Mm-hmm. Like we, see, we see them fall into the, the cycles and continue to stay there. No one ever breaks free of that cycle in either season. Um, and that's something that is kind of frustrating that when you continue on, you're like, man, we've seen all the growth in the past. We didn't even get to witness it. Yep. Um, but that also gives a level of invincibility to the characters. They, by default, are high schoolers. So high schoolers already have a sense, like, we all remember that point in time in our lives where we still had the child, like nothing can kill us, but we're also making adult decisions that could kill us. <laughs> um, sort of attitude that we approached with life during that time. And all of these characters have had situations in which they have had to survive from. So they have all survived and feel invincible from that survival. So they're taking that into their next choices. And again, making decisions that could and will eventually kill them. Mm-hmm. So that is something that's also connected to like the age of high school. Yeah, I think so. And it, this is especially seen in Rue. But the reason why I chose um, a shot of Cassie for invincibility, because I think that there there is this invincibility of youth is like true in the show. But I'm not sure how much it was like planned for that to be there versus it just kind of happening. Because here's like an example of where the invincibility of youth comes in. That's actually, I think, a good example of like bad writing. So in season one, the way that Cassie ends her her story in that season is that she gets pregnant. She tells McKay, that's her boyfriend at the time, that she wants to that she wants to keep the baby, but she's kind of like haha joking about it, like testing the waters to see if he's interested. And McKay is not interested. Okay, he does not want to keep the baby, that he doesn't want to be involved like he's not really you know he's not really there for that so um that results in cassie going and having an abortion we come back from season two it's like what abortion she just moved on she has a whole new problems now and is worried about totally other things um you know like her crush on nate and the fact that her and mckay are breaking up but no one talks about the abortion she never seems to have any sort of emotional fallout from the abortion she just kind of like she just kind of like moves on which doesn't make any sense to me um but uh, but i think because uh, in this age where there's we're so invincible, it can be easy as a writer to just sort of like, oh, here's the drama. Okay, you know, everybody got the shock value out. Okay, just like, psh, 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 just like brush to the side, brush to the side. Which we've all seen in like CW shows. Like this yes. is not an uncommon theme and ac- an accident and, and way of coping with writing teenagers. This happens all the time. However, again, we're not writing for teenagers. We're writing about teenagers, which means that the audience does expect a level of follow through yeah. that might not be in character or you can pat, or you can do the lazy writing of sitting there and being like, whatever about it. Mm-hmm. It does. Uh, and it, very, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say very quickly with Blue Island, I wanted to just very quickly say that I agree with you. I personally feel that none of these characters in Euphoria are, are bad characters. I just sit there and want to point out that we see no development from any of them in two seasons worth of a show. Yeah, which is a They're lot. They're not bad characters. They're no. great characters. But it just it just shows that there is a there is a clear limitation of the writer. So this particular show, there is no writer's room. Okay, so we can we, we've compared a couple of times to a CW show, but it's not written like a CW show. Okay, Sam Levinson wrote this period. I mean, there's definitely parts where he got help. For example, in those um, in between episodes, uh, the actress for Jules wrote a lot of that. Um, you know, cause it's a lot about her character and, uh, and we wanted, he wanted like a real trans experience there. Um, there are things that happened on set that resulted in certain writing. For example, originally in season two, Kat had an arc about an eating disorder that she was going to have. And she said, as a plus size model, I don't think that's appropriate to make my character storyline be about food in any way or about weight in any way. Um, well, Sam didn't like that. And that's why in season two, Kat basically has no storyline. And it's really just about her being dissatisfied with her boyfriend. Um, so like there are times where where the actors like help 
and influence the writing and um, or, or feedback that they've given results in certain things in the writing. Uh, however, this is really written by Sam Levinson. He is an auteur in this show. He wrote it. He, um, he did a lot of the work on it. The main piece of the show that he didn't do was like the music. Somebody else did that. But as far as like how it's shot and how it's written and, and how it's directed, that's all Sam. And, 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 you know, when you have only one writer, it can be hard to find your plot holes. And he's not very good at finding his plot holes. <laughs> He's not, and he's also not good about hearing about them. No, he's uh, not. <laughs> and welcome in, Moisty. I see you there. Thank you so much for lurking. We love our lurkers here. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, so no, I think that there, there's, I think that high school was the right choice for this. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's successful, I just also think that the media, especially in season one, after the math, didn't get that. Mm -hmm. didn't understand and then when it was sold to teenagers to be like oh this is about teenagers you'll love this it was like teenagers didn't connect for that to this mm -hmm. like no no teenager watches this show for fun not really like my sister's my sister's 18 she just got into it and she hates half of it because she doesn't understand the complexity of half of it. <laughs> because it's not for her. Like, I mean, in the Halloween episode, Jules shows up dressed like the Juliet angel from the Romeo and Juliet that came out in the early 2000s. This show was written for 35 year olds. Like this show was written for my exact demographic. Teenagers, no, it's not written for them. <laughs> Yeah, and it was very funny to like talk to her, someone who was 10 years younger than me, about a show that she she doesn't understand yet because frankly, she's still just coming out of this age, but also just doesn't understand the complexities of all of these characters because she hasn't had enough experience to understand all of these characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's a very interesting thing that HBO chose, but I do believe is doing successful with it. It'll be yeah. interesting to see because I think that there is a character's not developing for one season is totally fine, especially when it's a storytell narrative where we learn the development of characters through flashback, which is a beautiful thing. Two seasons is forgivable and can be pulled off. And I do think was successfully pulled off to an extent. I don't think it can happen this way in a third season. Yeah, no, I totally agree. If you go on YouTube, you'll see like tons of like video essays and things like that about how terrible season two is. Well, we're going to talk about that next episode about why <laughs> season two is terrible. But spoilers, the reason season two is terrible all exist in season one. Okay, that's your spoiler. Come back next week to hear more details about that. Season two isn't terrible. That's all. <laughs> Unless you also think season one is terrible, right? Because they both have the same problems. In fact, I liked season two more, but we'll get back to that later. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so why high school? We've answered that. <clears throat> all right, we need an ad break. Okay. Uh, Thank, thank you to our sponsor here on Enter Stage Window is Audible. We love books. Uh, we dissect books as well as movies and TV shows here on Enter Stage Window. So I also just love to read. Uh, I have no life. So uh, I have a suggestion for you this week. And that is if you like mystery and unknowing and confusion and age and youth and toxic codependent friendships, then man, I have a book for you. It is called We Were Liars by E.G. Lockhart. Uh, and you can go ahead and look at that um, audibletrial.com slash window. It is available. It's a short little vignette. It's about a young girl whose uh, family has an island off the coast of Massachusetts. And uh, they visit it every year. And something happened one year that after an accident that she doesn't remember what it is and nobody in her family will tell her anything about it. So she must go to her friends and other family members to discover what happened to that mysterious summer that she cannot remember and what and who are the liars within her life. Uh, so 100% would recommend that. Again, check it out at audibletrial.com slash enter stage window. Yes. All right. AudibleTrial.com slash interstage window. That is where you can go to start your 30-day free trial. 
and we do get a kickback from that and I'm pretty sure that happens as soon as you start your trial you don't actually have to pay for your first month so little little sneak sneaky thing you can do there get a free okay. book that's a <laughs> Cool. Yes. Okay. So when it comes to season one of Euphoria, as I was watching it, I felt like there was kind of this thesis question that Sam Levinson was attempting to answer. And that is what makes you worthy? Every single character in this show goes through some kind of situation where they are questioning their own self-worth and they're doing it through various lenses. Um, season two doesn't have this so much. We'll talk about that next week. But for season one, you absolutely do get this ensemble cast where every character is trying to find their worth. Um, and of course they are because it's set in high school and that's what everyone is doing in high school. They're experimenting with their identity. They're experimenting with what they think is important in their life and they're looking for what makes them worthy. So we're going to talk about a few different things where um, we have different situations where characters think like, oh, this thing might make me worthy or that thing might make me worthy. So we're going to talk about these conceptually. And um, we are going to talk about also which character or characters, sometimes it's kind of multiple, but usually it's kind of like one main character that exemplifies that that thing. So, um, so yeah, that's what we're going to go into is what makes you worthy. I think season one is attempting to answer this question. I agree. It is the thesis of this season. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, I think we should start right off the bat with the obvious one, which is the one that kind of punches you in the face. And that's sobriety. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, um, my gosh. Rue is a drug addict. She started doing drugs after her father, or actually when her father gets sick uh, with cancer, she starts taking his pain medication and continues to do it through his uh, death and funeral and therefore after and continues to do it for about a year until she goes to uh, rehab and then continues to do off and on after rehab. Mm -hmm. um, and sobriety is where she is written to be her best um that as the audience we are watching someone struggle with addiction in a way that i don't think has really been portrayed mainstream and on an as popular platform in a as empathetic way as euphoria does it but the thesis of this still is that you are more worthy when you are sober. Um, because that is the thing that everyone wants Rue to be. And that is the thing that she even wants to be, even if she doesn't know it herself. Yes. So, um. so Oreo wants to be sober. <laughs> he probably wants right back out, but he was scratching at the door. All right. So, so yeah, when it comes to Rue, she, she is born with some sort of mental illness that we do not necessarily figure out what it is. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's hinted. It's hinted because at one point she Googles like, how do you know if you're bipolar? But anyway, the point is, is that she never gets a diagnosis. So while her father, when her father contracts cancer and is kind of living out the end of his life, he's in kind of a situation where he's going through chemo. Um, the, his prognosis isn't very good. And so he's on a lot of pain medication to keep himself comfortable and regular and all of those things, right? And so what Rue does is she starts taking his pills because like he's too sick and high to tell that she's high too. And so she basically does drugs with him. Whereas, you know, for him, it's approved because he's freaking dying for her. Not so much. And she is, she's, I mean, this isn't an excuse for it, um, but she is thrown into the role of caretaker. Her mother mm -hmm. is at work. Her sister is too young. She is the person responsible for her father's care while her mother is at work. Um, so there is that level of being like, hey, I'm taking care of my dad who's dying and he doesn't even know that I'm here. Le like it's almost sold as a bonding experience at one point. Like yeah. you see a them both high <laughs> uh, and Rue's almost taking it that way of a bonding experience. I think that that is for the benefit of Rue's reasonings for it rather than the audience being sold that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it certainly is something to take into consideration with all of this. Yeah, but it seemed pretty clear to me that the whole reason that she did that is because she is not being treated 
for her what we assume is bipolar disorder like she's still not diagnosed at this point in the show so we have no proof but the writing hints strongly at that she is bipolar strongly a bipolar disorder uh, uh bipolar disorder and then also if you if you have a a um <laughs> personality a, like bipolar or a mental illness such as this the likelihood of you being an addict is exponentially larger mm -hmm. um it is that that sort of like lack of dopamine receptor is all of a sudden turned on which is what when people have bipolar what they're kind of lacking uh or what their brain is not able to always function on its own for so all of a sudden that is fulfilled in a way that is like oh I actually feel like a normal person when I am on drugs. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, why drugs work, um, but also why addictive drugs are even more addictive for people who do not have uh, the the brain functioning of a normal quote unquote person. Right, which is why if you're going to use drugs to treat your illness, please do so under the guidance of a doctor. <laughs> which Rue obviously does not. Um, so so Rue, Rue has all of... Yeah. But Rue has all of these experiences where, where she becomes an addict and you've got other characters around her doing drugs without becoming an addict. So the show does acknowledge that like, it's not the drugs, it's the special combination of Rue and her, what she's been through with her father dying and how, how devastating that was for her, plus her mental illness kind of all coming together to make it so that she cannot do these drugs safely. She can't. She can't just do them for fun on the weekends. Like, that's not something which, Ruaz can do. Which is new. Like, that is also not necessarily shown with drug addiction in TV shows yeah. in, in the past. Is that a lot of the, uh, especially from the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of the, like, vernacular and thoughts on drugs is that if you do it once, you'll be addicted forever. Yeah, it's like, uh, do drugs and you'll die. <laughs> um, and the reality is, is that that's, not how it happens. It happens that way for some people, but it doesn't happen that way for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, and because we're being raised to believe that, hey, if you do drugs once, you'll die and become an addict and then your life will be ruined and you'll steal money from your little brother. Sorry, I just flashed back to an ad <laughs> that I watched on TV that was so not appropriate for me to watch at that age, but yet they made me watch it. Did, hey, did, um, was D.A.R.E. still a thing when you were in school? Because yes, Dare, Blue, I'm exactly thinking about D.A.R.E. and I can't remember when it stopped. Was that still, was that still a thing? D.A.R.E. was just coming out of it when I was in school. We did not have it, but other, my friend, other friends did from other schools. However, uh, Colorado, where I was born and raised, um, it is very famous for its anti-meth program. And mm -hmm. basically there was like this, like, don't do meth information statewide campaign mm -hmm. where you couldn't watch a TV show without like an anti-meth commercial and an, mm -hmm. an, an, an anti-meth board that was literally every highway. Um, so, so that was my experience with the anti-drug programming within America, but it did not have to do much of dare. Mm -hmm. Dare taught me how to make meth. So that was great. <laughs> Like dare that. was wild dare was wild y'all if you didn't go through dare like you missed a whole thing like dare had us thinking that like you did one weed and you were gonna die and so of course we all had to do the weed or whatever the drug was you know there was also a, a big um cocaine scene when i was growing up and um guess what none of us died a few of us did become addicts though <laughs> i didn't but and a few people became addicts but a lot of that addiction is also then lack of education so yes who, that they don't that okay i did it once i can quit and i do it recreation recreationally um but continue to do it so that it's no longer recreational and it's habit but not in the way that addiction was portrayed in the early 2000s and late 2010 or early 2010s um they didn't realize that they were an addict until it was too late and it had mm -hmm. nothing it was nowhere near the process in which the media was showing us on tv and commercials and in movies of this like suddenly you do cocaine once and you become a raging cokehead it was a slow progress of 
oh, I'm going to do it once at a party and then I'm going to do it here and there. And some of my friends do it and some of this do it. And then all of a sudden I'm using it as a coping mechanism because I'm not an addict because I am not what addiction looks like. And that's a problem because addiction looks like a lot of different things. Uh, So it's really nice and interesting to see different addictions play out in this show but Mm -hmm. specifically see it with Rue as it grows in a different way and her friends doing the same drugs and it not and it not growing yeah like her I mean her friends never like her little sister does some drugs and she never gets into a situation where she's forced to do fentanyl at at the dealer's house you know I mean that doesn't happen to Gia and it probably won't happen to Gia you know um it because it's just not you know because she's not an addict because she's not an addict and Maddie and E and Maddie and Cassie just do E one day mm-hmm. and they can and they have a massive terrible hangover the next day, but they're certainly not like itching to go do it the next day. Yeah, I mean Cassie literally says, I can't do that again. It was awful. And then she literally she doesn't do it again. <laughs> exactly. And for some people, that is how it works. They don't necessarily need or it drugs don't hit the way that it would for someone who has the natural the uh, the predilection of 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 addiction, whether mm-hmm. it be geno- ge- uh, wow wow words are hard, whether it be genetically or trauma based, mm-hmm. which for um, her it's both. She gets a Rue double whammy. Really yeah. Um and and for other and I can probably argue for other people in the show it's probably both too. There's probably <laughs> a reason why we never see Nate do any hard drugs, uh, and that's because man that's a cokehead waiting to happen. <sighs> Um, <laughs> I could not imagine Nate doing hard drugs like he would be awful. He would be awful. By the way, Landon, I have to tell you, we did our, per- you know, we do the personality quizzes at the beginning of the Thursday stream. So I did a witch euphoria character. You guess who I got? Did you get, who did you get? I got Nate. I was like, I think this quiz was messed up, but I got Nate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think this person like had a soft spot for Nate or something. <laughs> But yeah, when it comes when it comes to um to the way that it's portrayed in Euphoria, like and and Rue is one of the characters that um I had a lot of trouble like understanding how she was written. And I'll have to tell you guys that um I don't think Zendaya is that great of an actress. Sometimes she has like really awesome scenes, like the dick pic scene. I think is great. I think when she's going around and um and she's like she's like the the detective, like the old timey detective in that little that part of the little fantasy. Like that's good. When she's when she's running from the cops, I think she does a good job in that scene, even though it lasts like way too long, right? But when she's just like r- walking around, like I don't know, she's just she's just not very interesting to look at. And this doesn't happen just in Euphoria. The same thing happens for me for her character in. Spider-Man. I don't, I don't like the new MJ. I think she's like a really negative Nancy. And, um, and so, you know, I'm not a huge Zendaya fan. Um, however, people that criticize like that Rue herself as a character is not realistic. I don't think that's true. She is very realistic. Like the reason why you're frustrated with Rue, like that's what it's like dealing with an addict. It's very, very frustrating where they constantly cycle and go back. I think that that is the thing that people don't understand either because they do not have experience with addicts or they have too much experience with addicts. Maybe too and much, are yeah. And dependent relationships with addicts that they are not willing to see. And Rue kind of shines a light on that. Um, I think the show does a good job of trying to get the audience to love Rue at every aspect of her sobriety, even though it does per- does push the narrative of she is more worthy when sober. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because, and, and like, it's hard because it's hard to not want to, like to portray what addiction is from the perspective of the person who is being hurt by the addict while also portraying the addict in a way that is loving and kind. Yeah. Um, and that won't get the audience to turn against her and won't demonize her, especially because addiction is already demonized within our society and media. 
And so really like, even demonizes it herself. Like she catches yeah. Gia doing some drugs and she has to go confront the guy that was doing it with her um, because she's scared that Gia might become an addict too, even though like we see no evidence that, that Gia is at risk for that. But I mean, we don't know. We don't really get to know Gia very much during the first two seasons, to be honest. Like maybe she is at risk, like who knows. Um, but uh, but we know that we know that Rue values sobriety because even though she can't achieve it herself, she expects it out of others. Like she's very uncomfortable at the Halloween party when Jules decides she wants to get totally shit faced like rue does not like that she doesn't want to hang out with drunk jewels you know she doesn't want that she she has this kind of longing to rekindle her friendship with lexi um lexi's kind of like her straight edge sober friend right who they used to be really good friends with her when they were little before she started doing drugs um and and she constantly has this desire to like rekindle and, and keep alive that friendship with lexi even though like lexi is has moved on you know lexi's over it she's not, not really. she's not I, I disagree with that she enables it for most of the first season she does she does but she's not like actively pursuing a friendship with rue she enables it when no. rue comes to her right I like just... lexi's not yeah lexi's not calling rue lexi's just like can't tell Rue no when Rue shows up at her door. You know, that's Although, the difference there. Lexi does call Rue because Rue reads the play before Lexi puts it on. Yeah, in season two, but not in season one. Yeah. In season one, it's all it's all like Rue at, t- talking to Lexi for help. I think that we see, we see one of the most beautiful scenes, I think, of this entire show uh, is when Rue has been denied to go to rehab in season two. Um, she's already run away. She's gotten in a lot of trouble. She's stolen a lot of drugs. Um, she's basically already, she freaked out at her family because they basically, uh, Jules ratted her out and, and said that she was on drugs and, uh, mom was demanding for her to get sober. Rue ran away, freaked out, all of that. And she's in bed with her mom after being denied, uh, rehab. And her mom basically says, If you want to do drugs, you get to do them. Go ahead. I'm going to start focusing on your sister now because Mm -hmm. that is what your sister needs. Uh, And if I have the choice of losing one daughter or both, I'm going to save the daughter I can save. And it's up to you to save you. Uh, And I think that that really shows like the value of sobriety of being the expectation of her being sober within that life. Um, But it also puts it in perspective of the people who have been close to addicts and the Mm -hmm. level of, you have to get to of acceptance to sit there and be like, I can't control if this person does drugs or not, but I can control protecting the people around them. Yep, it does. It does. It does feel really bad. It's a really sad scene. I know it kind of like hit me in the gut because I don't know, like I watched that scene and I thought like, yeah, I do the same shit her mom is doing. I'd make the same decision. Like that's the healthy decision Mm -hmm. in terms of codependency, which you already have if you're a mother child, but you even have even more so when your kid is an addict Um, and and when you've lost a lot like her mom has. Yeah. So it, it is that level of like, oh, you have to be able to let go and recognize that this person is human and know that they are worthy and worthy of love and a good character, no matter where they are in their sobriety, just Mm -hmm. like every person you meet. Uh, And I appreciate that this story is being told in this way. However, I still wish that there was a lack of like push for she has to be sober. Well, I just think, I I just, I just think that it's, it's almost like Rue wants to be sober. So I think this is where we say like Sam Levinson is an artur here. I I assume that he felt that way. Like when he was going through the the deep part of his drug addiction that he just wanted so desperately to be sober. Um, But yeah, so, so to go back to Rue's mom for just a second, um, I just, I really connected with her in that scene. So this is not not something I've ever talked about on stream, but I do have um, an addict in my life that's a very, very similar situation to Rue. As a child, had an undiagnosed something wrong with their brain. I don't know what it is. Still, we still don't know. This person is a full-on adult now and has been an addict since they were a teenager. And, uh, you know, despite best efforts, 
they are still an addict and they don't seem to have any interest in actually not becoming an addict, but they do constantly have lucid moments where they think they're going to get sober. It never lasts. And, um, and so I have literally been Rue's mom in that situation. And there is no other choice because you can't sacrifice yourself for that other person. Like you still have to go live your life. You know, it's not, you're not helping the addict by circling your life around them. You're not. Nope. Um, and I think that that is part of the lesson that is being told in the story too. Uh, and I appreciate that. Yeah. It's <laughs> nice. Yeah. Living with, uh, living with an addict, knowing an addict, loving an addict is, it, it's hard. And at times it feels downright impossible. Yeah. Um, and this really shows all of it, but also like accepting the part the fact part of that is accepting the fact that some people never will never want to be sober mm -hmm. and that is their decision yeah you can't it's, they still have bodily bodily autonomy just like we all do and so that's and, the choices that they make and you get to build your boundaries and you get to decide hey what is it that i'm willing to accept what is it that i can accept what is it that i can do to help if i feel like i have to help but at a certain level you also have to sit there and be like, they get to choose what to do with their body. And that doesn't make them any less of a person. That decision doesn't make them any less worthy of love. It just means that how I love them might have to be different than mm -hmm. how I love somebody sober. Yep. Yep. You might have to do it from a distance. That just might be, have to be how it is. Yep. And um, that's something that I wish the show was able to explore a little bit more. Yeah, I think because that's one of the things that the high school setting holds it back from. Like we're not we're not looking at 25, 35, whatever year old Rue. You know, we're looking at 16 year old Rue, right? Where she's still living with her mom, you know? Yep. So yeah, that's sobriety. What what makes you worthy? Definitely sobriety is one of the things that the show believes makes you worthy. Monogamy. <laughs> So this is a show about high school, which means there's all kinds of couples, all kinds of cheating, all kinds of all that stuff. Okay. All kinds. And it's so interesting how, like a part of me believes that Sam has to be polyamorous because <laughs> of how much start of poly stuff there is and like undertone of like open communication and just like simply accepting another person and and the different levels of love and everything like that um but also is so wholeheartedly pushing monogamy with mm -hmm. every single character you know i have this uh, head canon too and like i don't want to i don't want to project onto him so like you know sam if you're ever watching this sam levis is never gonna watch my fucking show whatever <laughs> But like, um, I don't, I don't like want to say that I'm projecting onto him, but like when I watched this show, there were certain things that I'm like, we know Sam has been an addict before. Like he's talked about that in interviews, but there's other things in the show where I'm like, Hmm. And this is definitely one of them where I feel like Sam is maybe a closeted polyamorous person because there's all these things in the show. Like, okay. The main, like the OTP of the show, main couple, first image we've got here, right here above my head, Rue and Jules. This is in episode one, fucking adorable shot right here. I had to include it. I freaking love it, you know. Um, By the way, it's also, sorry, I have to go on this thing. This is how they introduce the fact that, that Jules is trans. They don't say anything about it. It's never no, a hot topic they just, episode. Or they just show her. Literally show her as she is. And it's no big fucking deal for anybody. And that's beautiful. Anyway, sorry, I had to just go on a soapbox. I'm better now. Go ahead. <laughs> it's nice, right? It's nice to see. So you've got so you've got this couple of, of Rue and Jules, but because Rue is not really totally in touch with her own sexuality, they call each other best friends, but man, they ain't best friends. They're girlfriends, okay? Period. Um, there is no, there's no best friends about it. Like they hang out together constantly. They talk about deep stuff. They, um, they sleep together, you know, they cuddle. They do all the things, you know, they do all the things. And um, however, at the same time, Jules is texting Nate in the second picture you don't we don't know what he does she doesn't know it's nate you know it, she finds him on like a tinder type of website where he is out trolling for peeps because you know he's got to get his fuck on because that's how nate is right and then um and then so jules and him kind of get connected and start to like each other and um 
she basically falls for him, falls for the internet version that, that Nate is portraying of this guy. He calls himself Tyler on this app or whatever, right? And Jewel falls for him. And Rue like literally helps, like Rue literally helps like take, you know, softcore porn pictures to send to Nate, like gives, um, gives Jewel's encouragement at how to talk to Nate. Um, she even expresses like the way that their first meeting goes down with, um, they're going to meet like at the back of the fair, which is super sus. And Rue points this out the same way that like a friend would that was kind of like rooting for the relationship to say like, this is sus, you need to meet in public. You know, this is dangerous. Something's going or on Madeline. here. Oh. Yeah, oh, whatever. <laughs> right. Well, so so it's, it's, it's this very interesting kind of like polyesque sorts of sort of thing. <laughs> And it's because here's the deal, like they're, the, you, we can call them girlfriends all you want, but it's also a, uh, like the whole Rue and Jules relationship is also just a, I, I think it's a commentary on queer relationships in general. And just that like with how straight heteronormative relationships tend to present themselves, it is very black and white. Mm -hmm. It is very defined. There is clear lines, whereas in queer relationships, there aren't like mm -hmm. we want like the media wants to project that there are but it gets as someone who has many queer relationships very confusing very quickly <laughs> how much you are like actually like connecting or communicating or what the intentions are it's always just like a little bit of a like what the fuck is going on and that's where like stereotypes of lesbian relationships moving very quickly comes from is because Usually those lesbians have been friends forever or uh, or like gay relationships and gay people and, and men, gay men sleeping with each other all of the time. And it's it's like that's where the that's where the line crossing happens. And then the media turns that and portrays that. And so like what ruined ruined um, Jules's relationship really is a commentary on is the idea of that unknown space that is to be young and queer in a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but you have that, and then you do have like the idea of Rue helping out to to get <laughs> her friend laid, um, but at the same and fall in love also because she does fall in love with with who she thinks Tyler is. Um, but you also underneath that have Rue wishing of like being like, I wish this was me. I wish we were monogamous. I wish you weren't doing this, um, which is interesting because there is no communication happening and it feels very young but mm -hmm. at the same time it's like okay there is that subtle push of monogamy even though literally there are tropes of polyamory happening <laughs> yes um, and it's it's very and, <laughs> and it's very much like it's very much like it makes me wonder like sam levinson is supposedly um a cishet straight dude he's a white dude right which we're gonna we're going to talk about race and race stuff next episode too. That'll be fun. Um, but, uh, but he, he's, he's cishet straight. Right. And yet the way that he makes the queer relationships so different than the heterosexual relationships makes me think that like, but is he really, <laughs> or at the very least, like he must hang out in a lot of gay circles, you know? Yes. So, so like, for example, he talks the, the scene where we find out that, Cat is a um, well-loved and prolific fanfic author um, on the internet. It makes me think that at minimum, Sam was like in that space, which that space is incredibly queer, right? So for anybody that's been in it um, or, or was in it, like that space, that space be gay, okay? It don't matter how cishet straight you are, like you will end up doing and thinking gay things because the space is so um, saturated with, uh, with LGBT, you know, stuff. Right. And so like the way that he writes this, it feels very real to me. Like it feels very real in everything that I know about, um, about being poly, about experiencing queer relationships. And then you've got this flip side, right? So you've got, um, Cassie and, uh, McKay, and they have a very straight relationship where they have a very clear line of they are together, you know, she gets pregnant, um, he moves on with like his college stuff and he kind of, you know, goes out of the picture. She has the abortion and they base they break up. Right. And then she very clearly and deliberately gets with Nate 
and it is a cheating plot because Nate is with Maddie or wants to get back with Maddie. Like it's a whole thing, right? And the love triangle, the love triangle between Maddie and Nate and, uh, and Cassie is very heteronormative, you know, incredibly heteronormative. And both of those plot lines feel, have, have high verisimilitude to me. <laughs> Uh, and then very quickly, I just wanted to add in this too. We also see Jules flirting with another woman towards yes. the end of season, a season one, where she and Rue are basically together. Like they've started making out and shit like that. Um, but then she hooks up with this woman and it's a, about the femininity and, and it's about, I mean, it is definitely about her own view of, of herself and, and is the next step of her trans journey, journey. But it is a very interesting, like, feeling a, a, of interest to see like that she is pushed towards this idea of Polly and then it's even doubled down when we start getting that Rue might be asexual or doesn't have a sexual drive now we don't know that if that's because of the drugs or if that is because of yeah, uh, she might just be too high all the time we don't know <laughs> but it is definitely pushed that way because then all of a sudden there is like a cheating thing that happens and it's interesting to see in season two um with with I cannot remember his name Everett Avery Elliot Elliot Elliot. I'm thinking of Elliot um and um where Jules cheats on Rue with Elliot in season two and that is more clearly defined but even then like it's not Mm -hmm. (laughs) like that's not the big thing that that Jules even fucking cares about because they're making out all in the same room together um, it's also like that Jules cares about the fact that, or not Jules, Ruth cares about the fact that Jules told her mom that she was not sober. Like that's yeah. the thing she's angry about in that situation, not even the cheating. <laughs> yeah. And what, and the thing, and the thing that, um, that really gets, but see, Jules is different. Like Jules yeah. does care about making sure that the lines of communication are open. Like she does, she has this little thing where she gets like, um, obsessed with like maybe Elliot and Rue are hooking up behind her back, right? And she thinks that that's the issue because they're the because Jules and Rue are not getting along too well in the bedroom. Like things are not flowing. There's a scene where Rue fakes an orgasm and Jules is pretty sure that she did, and it's like it's like a whole thing, right? And then so Jules starts to think like, well, maybe Rue is actually interested more in Elliot and that's why we're not connecting in the bedroom and da 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 da. So like Jules is concerned with um, with that sort, with open communication and knowing what's going on and she doesn't want Rue hiding anything from her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we do know, like there is also a hint of Rue being A, Ace, Ace, uh, because in the beginning, in the season one, she basically goes, uh, like, goes up to her sex history um and it's very it's very small and also there's no real push for it other than the fact that she feels something for Jules Mm -hmm. um so there is like no interest in like receiving and maybe only a little bit in giving and Mm -hmm. so like that's an interesting concept on top of this because it just adds to the queerness and then also queer and polyamory have a lot of crossover so it's just interesting (laughs) and i hope they keep it kind of ambiguous like i don't want it to be like um rue coming out and being like i am ace and that means this like i want it i want it to stay ambiguous where like i don't know like the way the way that she is in season two where she's not super interested in receiving but she's kind of interested in giving and she's definitely interested in cuddling and kissing and things like that like i would love to see kind of that play out because i feel like like when i think about the very very few asexual examples in um in media that we have it is mostly the style of like no sex please ever i don't want it you know either they are they are sex repulsed or they're just completely sex disinterested but in my experience in talking with for real ace people y'all some of the most sexual people i've ever met and i don't mean like in a physical sense but i mean like y'all love talking about sex y'all love reading about sex y'all love watching sex y'all love like masturbation you just don't really seem too interested in involving another person in certain then that's and that's like what i know of people in real life so i feel like rue's um portrayal of asexuality is a lot closer to people i actually know Ace is an umbrella too. So like, that's something to also like, both are true. Both can be true. However, I think that the uh, het straight consumer is more, understands more the idea of no sex at all than the idea of like, 
very, very, very low sex drive or sex drive in only certain situations or just being repulsed by certain things or even not being into it, but doing it because your partner enjoys it. Like that's a lot more to handle, I think for some uh, straight hat people. And so it's just easier to sit there and be like, nope, no sex. Um, (laughs) But I do like the idea of keeping it ambiguous because the other thing is youth and queer ambiguity is a very common theme that I think we need to see more, especially if we're talking to a generation that is not this generation, a generation Mm -hmm. that has been told, hey, you don't have to be closet. You, it's okay to be gay, but it's not okay for you to be gay. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of that gen, that millennial old, older Gen Z was told that like gay rights are fine, but also you don't want to be gay um that was definitely true for for my childhood experience like like gay was okay for them but you don't want to be gay you don't want to be gay and I think that that is something that a lot of millennials have experienced Mm -hmm. and so watching ambiguity in young people and being able to like connect to that might help and heal a lot of those people who are still in that ambiguous like circle that are so desperate to find a label or don't understand or pushing it down more than they want yeah um because I don't think that exists as much in the younger generation now but it certainly exists in our generation and that's Mm -hmm. who the show is for yeah and I know that's how I feel like I am not very comfortable with um ascribing certain labels I mean if if I'm pressed like I'll tell you but like when you when we asked about like my gender we talked about it for two hours you know I have a stream on that like and I couldn't tell you like okay if you press me I'm gonna say like okay I'm like a cis woman but like that's not that's not the full story and I think that that's pretty common for a lot of millennials we're not interested in like a precise label because of the ambiguous time that we came up and the way that like gay rights was important but gay people were not you know um so yeah and labels are like a thing that like I think queer people connected to in order to feel seen yeah but now recognizing that that queerness can't be labeled because queerness looks different for everybody um and what lesbian means to you might be different what lesbian means to me what gay means to somebody or queer means to someone or trans means to somebody will be different to another person Mm -hmm. and that is something that I think the show is hinting at without even making it a main point yeah. And yeah. they're it's again that kind of like monogamy thing is is tied up in there. Yep. And and because nobody in this show really um is very good at monogamy, they are all punished within their relationships. Not a single relationship goes well, which is why monogamy monogamy made it on this list of the like what makes you worthy because I feel like the show is ultimately saying that like if you are not monogamous, your relationships are going to suffer because not a single character in here has a positive relationship and they all have um, various complicated relationships with monogamy. Yes, uh, but even the monogamous relationship suffered. So maybe it's just like a lack of love in general. <laughs> <laughs> but even all like, right. but, even, but even the ones like Cassie's relationship with McKay is great. They just don't work out and they, they break up, you know? It's really like her not, trash... And she also cheats on him. So like, yeah, that's not exact- <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. On okay, to the next. next one. Okay, we're going to talk about my favorite, my bae, the best character in this whole show. I love her. You love her. We all love her. Freaking Cat. She's the best. Whatever, Landon. Shut up. Okay. Cat's awesome. She writes fan fiction online. She gets popular for writing. Um, one Direction fan fiction, right? And uh, and here's like her Tumblr. <laughs> it's a fake Tumblr, by the way. This doesn't exist. And, and the story is is more like an amalgamation of lots of One Direction fan fiction. But, um, but she, this actress is a plus size model and the character is considered fat. Now I do have one small gripe with this character. So when she's introduced, we find out that the reason she's fat, like she, she wasn't, and then she went on a vacation and over the course of that one week vacation, she drank like 50 pina coladas, no exaggeration. It's literally like 50 pina coladas. She drank like four or five a day or something. And she came back fat and she never lost the weight. So, so I want to have a, I have a small gripe here. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think you can have one week of being bad and then gain weight and never lose it. Like 
That's not my experience with weight. That's not anybody that I know's experience with weight. <laughs> Landon, do you know anybody that's had that experience with weight? Like one bad week, mess them up forever? No, but I think that that, what that portrays is the experience of betrayal with body, which fat people do have. True. And it's that idea of like, hey, if I could just pinpoint this bad behavior in which I fucked up and my body turned out the way that I don't like it. And I think that that's what that whole scenario is trying to encompass. And it speaks mostly only to people who have that scenario. And it speaks to a joke for people who do not. And that's why it's also ucky. Cause it's like, it's not, that's not the point. <laughs> yeah. And it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Cause I think Kat is a great character with tons of potential, but unfortunately Kat starts to touch on things that I think Sam maybe doesn't have experience with where I think that when he writes about drugs and sobriety, when he writes about monogamy, when he writes about masculinity, spoilers, that's coming next. Um, it's, excuse me, it feels like very high verisimilitude. But this, like some of the things that Kat goes through, there's like little bits in there that are like, mm, that's not quite right. That's not quite right, right? But I still do love the arc that she goes on where she kind of she kind of realizes through a, a, a series of scenarios that, um, that even though she's got more weight than her peers, um, she is still desirable. She can still be seen as desirable if she's willing to use her body. And so she ends up doing a bunch of cam girl work and making a whole lot of money. Um, and and so I, I think that when it comes to what the show is saying, like it rewards her for her hypersexuality in season one, which I think is really interesting because at least from what I know, having an experience with hypersexuality as a, as a teenager is usually like more of a trauma response. Like people don't like a lot of teenagers are really horny, right? But there's a difference between being super, super horny and becoming a cam girl when you're under the age of 18. Okay. There's a difference there. So I think what Kat is experiencing is not like a normal level of high sex drive. It is like so much more. And that's why I'm labeling this hypersexuality and, and why I feel like the show kind of makes it seem like that's a good thing to be. Yeah, I think that that's my issue with Kat is not the character. It's not even, it's not the actress. I think the actress is fantastic. I think it's awesome to see a character like this. However, uh, fat girl gets obsessed with sex is a trope that has been played before and is tired um, of like sitting there and being like, oh, I feel good in my body and I found worthy in my body. And that is, but it's not even I feel good in my body. It's that I figured out I could please other people with my body and therefore I have worth. Mm -hmm. And that is a played trope. Um, and it's exhausting. And because of how Sam wrote this and in his inexperience with it, we never see the other side of that. Mm -hmm. It is only portrayed as a good thing of being like, oh, it's not claiming, she's 16. It's not claiming sexuality. It's not claiming her body. It's not claiming power back because she has felt fat her entire life. Uh, because like, she's 16. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is this is a trauma risk like you were saying this is a trauma response to being shamed and having so much fat phobia in her life that the only worth she can find in herself is the pleasure of other men or men men finding pleasure yeah, in her and it's older men which is true and like if you if you are um if you are a a teenager with some curves you know with cat's kind of body um, like older men, like they look at you, like, it's just true. Like, it's just true. Cause Kat isn't like fat in the sense that what you might typically think of again, she is a plus she's size fat. model. She is yeah. not, I mean, you know, she's, she is not fat. Like she is, she's, she's skinny fat. Like, yeah. she, is, well, like she has, she has like, of... she doesn't have a fat face, you know? Yeah. She doesn't have a fat face. And then there's also a lot of like, there, there, if you are part of the fat activism movement, then there's a lot of like dialogue that goes around with the idea of being skinny fat or mid-sized. She is larger than what society deems as average, which means that she falls into a plus size car a plus size uh like area. However, she is average 
if not smaller than average for the entirety of who people are. So in Hollywood, she's fat, but she's not actually fat. So yeah. it doesn't like considering her being fat is like sitting there and saying like, like anyone who wears a size 12 is fat. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's true. And true. it's, and it's true. And the average size in the United States is a size 18. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's really hard to swallow that pill. And then it's really hard to see this go down a stage as a, a, a trope that is very, very dependent on how other people see you rather mm-hmm. than actually reclaiming and becoming body neutral because she's not body neutral. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, mm-hmm. at 16, she can't be. Um, but it is portrayed in the show of like doing this, like I'm doing this fucking amazing thing in the show by talking about a fat girl being you know going on and and becoming a cam girl under age because she is so desperate to feel wanted by someone and then also that continues on her relationships it's not just older men it's the younger men in her it, around her as well that only find use for her in her physical body mm-hmm. including the boy that she ends up with because even though he does like her for her there's no chemistry. There's no actual scenes that have anything to do outside of her body and her thing, other than her thinking that he only wants her for her body. Like there's no actual chemistry there and that doesn't end up going anywhere. Mm -mm. Uh, And then to find out that Sam wanted to follow this up with her having an eating disorder is sad. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's really sad. Because that's another played trope. And I would have like I would have liked to see her this actual plot line here that happens in season one instead for her season two to like reach a more realistic conclusion because basically what happens is that she just gets tired of the whole cam girl thing and stops doing it and then she has a whole plot about like not really liking her boyfriend very much but here's the thing like that's not really how it is okay so i think i've talked about this on on stream before i wasn't 16 when this happened um although i did i did have a a period where hypersexuality did like um affect me when i was around cat's age now that being said the internet wasn't like it was today like there was kind of sort of cam girls but not really like it just streaming wasn't a thing like it wasn't a thing you know but um but when i was older i did do a little bit of camming for a brief period and the reason why i stopped and this isn't like an unusual experience i've talked to other people and they've had similar experiences but the reason why i stopped is because what a lot of these men really needed was not the service I was selling. They were very lonely and they needed friends and they needed therapy. And I realized that if I was going to keep doing this, I was going to be giving them a service that was exactly what they didn't need. And that didn't sit right with me and I couldn't do it anymore. And so I had to stop, even though it was um, much more lucrative than streaming uh, media critiques on Twitch, I have to say. (laughs) Definitely more tips an hour. Um, However, oh my gosh. (laughs) But um, but I couldn't do it anymore because I realized what what these men really needed to solve their problems was not what they were buying and therefore I could not sell um and still feel okay about it and I feel and Kat sort of like touches on this like she has a whole scene where she basically is fin doming with this guy and she starts to starts to put the pieces together but because she's only 16 she puts the pieces together of like men are stupid which like fair that's kind of what where I was at 16 too with hypersexuality is like wow men are freaking stupid but considering this is a tv show that's not really for teenagers I think we could have pressed it a little bit more I would have liked to see Cat develop a little bit more with how she felt about the way that her sexuality interacted with the older men that she was talking to online in a way that actually said something but instead it's just dropped she just makes a bunch of money and then she's like but i'm depressed still it doesn't and it just it doesn't go anywhere um it doesn't go anywhere and it's so sad because her episode is one of my favorite episodes of the entire thing and i think her character is great it's just that sam didn't hire another writer to help him with this and he should have because it could have been so cool very quickly i just wanted to add uh to to our sex work talk uh the amount of people i know that are therapists and have or either are sex workers still is a circle (laughs) <laughs> it's a circle uh, and that's because like successful step uh successful sex workers who have stayed with it and that is because people who are in sex work 
our therapists. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's what it felt like for me. And, and, and maybe no, it's and kind of like, no, no. and maybe it's like my vibe too. Like, and I kind of attract that. Um, well, but, uh, but I, I know I'm not alone in feeling that way. I've talked to others who similar, very similar yeah. experiences. And, and that's, and that's typically, and we're not, I'm not, when I'm talking about sex workers, I'm not talking about, it's all, it's all the same thing, but not like for less dancers or strippers that I know, all the strippers, a uh, few strippers. I yeah. I don't say, know. I feel like strippers might fall into the same thing. Um, but the cam girls or the people who have done like, like sex work, uh, it, like no, a hundred percent. It is like, they're like, no, the main job is not the blow job. It's the, it's the talking about life. Yeah. No, they're like, they're paying, they're paying for you to be their best friend. Yeah. That's what, that's what was happening. To like them and tell them what, and to listen to them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, sorry, I just wanted to make that quick comment, but also like, I, I think that hypersexuality has a place in the show and is necessary. I just wish it didn't coincide with the fat girl. I understand. Um, and, and, and I get, and I know that I am, I am very biased because I, I had a different, a very different experience. Um, I went, I'm the fat girl who became sex repulsed, um, because of how much I was either hypersexualized or how much I did not feel sexual. Um, and so like sitting there and, and then constantly having this, like, well, you're fat, so you should feel sexy kind of shoved down my throat whenever there is a fat character uh is it's difficult for me to swallow I'm so sorry for all of these puns um (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering I was wondering when you were gonna like acknowledge (laughs) it's just happening and you know what that's what happens when we talk about sex about sexuality and also being fat your mouth gets involved a lot um (laughs) no so I think that that is that is something that I really struggled with with this character and then even struggled even more with season two because you're absolutely right there is no follow through. Yeah. There is a complete disconnect between season one uh, cat and season two cat. Yep. Same character. I think that the cycle continues. It just it continues in a very different way. And hers feels the most frustrating because it doesn't go anywhere and has the most potential to go somewhere. Yeah. And even if they but, went with the ED, it still wouldn't have gone anywhere because I wanted to connect back to the camming. Yep. I want, and I, well, I also, what I wanted it to do was connect back to the fact that she was finding her worth in other people. And it didn't do that. Like even here in season two, we felt resolution to some extent with Nate, with Rue, with Jules, with Maddie, with Cassie, with Lexi. They're, they're not, their stories are not over. There's places for them to go in season three, but at least they ended their cycle. Mm -hmm. Kat didn't, didn't she didn't learn she didn't she wasn't pushed through anything and again it's that character development but it's like even less so she was a rock <laughs> like at least everybody else was tumbling in a laundry in a laundry <laughs> machine the same cycle she just sat there and that is because of the writing yeah uh, and an eating disorder might have done that it would have been another gross trope it would have been another way of sitting there and being like, this is how we're, we're, we're taking addiction and viewing it with empathy, but we're not taking an eating disorder and, or a fat woman and viewing that with empathy. We're going to just put an eating disorder on her. Okay. Like that's frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yep. We, but we need to move on for time's sake. So anyway, I loved Kat and I feel like the show did her dirty. I would have written Kat so much better. Hire me anyways. <laughs> masculinity masculinity okay (laughs) this is another this is another high verisimilitude moment for the show where it heavily um it heavily values masculinity in its male characters in particular with nate and with mckay right so um we have we have these situations okay bye blue (laughs) And uh, and we have these situations with these two characters where they are incredibly masculine. And, you know, McKay Mabay, McKay Mabay, the most, the best character, um, the nicest character, the coolest character. He's not even in season two because he's too cool for school. Um, but uh, but he's kind of like this very like driven, positive masculinity where he's like very goal oriented and trying very hard to like reach what his true potential is. 
And then you've got Nate, who is very like, um, almost like that violent masculinity, right? He's got like that violent masculinity. And, and Nate, Nate has this very interesting thing about his sexuality and the way it relates to his masculinity. He almost comes off to me like a man that while straight, is very interested in dick, <laughs> which I don't know if you've ever met this type of man, Landon, or if any of our viewers have ever met this type of man, where they they like, it's not that they're gay, but like, they like dick. And they are, they like are very particular about like what kind is in their porn. They like looking at it. They like interacting with it, but like, they don't want it like, they don't want to like date a man but like they're interested in that sort of thing. And I think in the show, the place that we see this the most is, well, one, he has a bunch of dick pics on his, of, on his phone from other guys that he's chatted up. But also like when he goes to beat up that guy that he's accusing of, um, of raping Maddie, even though he didn't, okay, like it was consensual, but Maddie is underaged. So, you know, it's statutory. Well, and, no, Maddie is underage and then also is saying that he raped, she, yeah, she she, she's saying she blacked out. Well, she's saying she blacked out. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and she didn't. Yeah, uh, she didn't. But in order to protect her relationship with Nate, she yes. But when, she but when person. Nate goes to confront this guy and, like, concocts that plan, like, I don't know. Did you feel like when he was beating him up that it was kind of like, it was kind of like a horny beat up? It was kind of like a sexy beat up? Was it kind of sexy? Like, what was going on there? <laughs> going on there toxic masculinity that's what was happening <laughs> no um, you said the t word but yes <laughs> uh no he uh yeah i think that there is i oh god that's something the fandom is saying right a lot yeah. of the fandom is saying and saying that nate is gay and he's the closeted he's the closeted gay homophobe um and f first of all i hope i hope to god they don't go that route because uh, we don't the queer community does not need another the bully is secretly gay and so he bullies other people trope yeah uh, i know it happens in real life but we just don't need that representation well, we've seen it so much we've seen it so much like i don't think i don't think that that's what he is though i, I think he's straight i just think he also likes dick you know but it's not but it's not like he likes men or masculinity or anything like that also incredibly traumatized from watching yes. his father's porn collection <laughs> and, and his dad's uh, in the in the movies and oh, stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's like that's really weird real weird uh and i think that again it is that competition of alpha male that that idea of who is the best best male and i think that that's where his obsession with like dick comes from is that dick has to look a certain way he has to be the best he like it's it's almost OCD in some aspects. Like, <laughs> it feels that way, doesn't it? Like his masculinity is constantly of, am I presenting the best? Am I being the best? Am I the best man? Am I the, am, do I have the best bod? Do I have this? Do I have the superiority of all my friends? Do yeah. I have this? Do I have that? Um, and it's, it's interesting because you're like sitting there and you said that like McKay is portrayed as like a better a better masculinity perspective but it's really not <laughs> because mckay does the same thing in a lot of ways yeah. where he controls cassie so much because of how other people are going to perceive him nate does the same thing he controls maddie because of how other people are going to see him he then later like tries to control cassie because of how other people are seeing mm -hmm. him um, it, it is this very idea of like masculinity is for show of other people. It's very like masculinity is a peacock. It is this idea of I am showing off for other people. Hear me roar. Um, I am superior and everyone flaunts and loves me for it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that the and I think that for for what makes me like so much more interested and connected to McKay's masculinity than Nate's is because like what you said about he's kind of OCD about it. Yeah. And um and and I mean that in like the colloquial sense, not in the diagnostic sense, but he does that with other people too. Like the introduction that Rue gives him is to list all of the things about women's bodies and and gender presentation that he likes, right? Like and it's down to like the types of shoes he likes and dislikes on a woman like it's crazy no he is he is so controlled in what he likes and i think that has a lot to do with our our next topic on him but i think that like that that hyper focus of 
what is acceptable and what will I deem as acceptable. And it, it's very, it's a very interesting perspective because at none of these points in time, we see a lot of this kind of toxic masculinity right now. If you're on TikTok or anything, any man with a podcast, I mean, I know that I'm a woman with a podcast, uh, but like, man, any, any white dude with a podcast needs to stop having a podcast. Uh, <laughs> and there's like, yeah, like I am the alpha man. So I deserve these things. Never does Nate think he deserves any of this. Yeah. It is just, again, his like, it is what he pictures is necessary to have a relationship that he wants to have. Uh, and it's because his world is so out of control and that he is very fucked up. It's true. Uh, because he's incredibly traumatized. And I will tell you, okay, white men, you're allowed to have a podcast if you let me come on it and promote my show. Then you can then you can keep your podcast. <laughs> Landon like stone face, no. <laughs> there are some white guys whose pot you know what? Here's the deal. You can have a podcast if you have something interesting to say. And if you have if what you think is interesting to say has anything to do with women and what you deserve, you don't need a podcast. <laughs> No one wants. Uh, I think what I think really what you're saying is you're kind of tired of all of this like, um, you know, incel esque, uh, pickup artist type of stuff that goes around TikTok. Which there's a freaking lot of that. There's a freaking yeah, lot of that. Any like guy with a podcast. Um, <laughs> yes, that's what I'm tired of. I yeah. listen. You do you. You have a Twitch stream. I can't talk. There's six people. There's not even six people listening to this. So like whatever. Like <laughs> you do you. you into the void but also i'm so tired of men <laughs> poor landon poor landon <laughs> if you're still if you're still here after us saying all of that thank you um i appreciate that you can tol tolerate the casual yeah, um misandry you can tolerate you the casual misandry we can be friends <laughs> if you are still here after all of that you can have a podcast <laughs> <laughs> yes yes <laughs> I, we're not trying to we're not trying to hurt your feelings blue we're just mean we're just mean catty bitches i'm sorry <laughs> that's it <laughs> but yeah okay so masculinity masculinity is clearly valued in this show um within the end of season two so because we're getting we're getting close to time and we still do have one other quick topic um mm -hmm. at the end of season two nate even has like a tiny redemption arc where he goes and gets the um uh the tape a jewels tape from his dad's collection because remember his dad films all of his encounters that he has and keeps them in this private porn collection and he had an encounter with jewels and so there's this tape and and nate has this kind of like tiny redemption arc where he goes and gets the tape and gives it to jewels and it's like we're supposed to feel like that that kind of is a step in the right direction for nate but it felt very like too little too late but at the same time it's Are like you? it's like the show is rewarding his masculinity because the way that he gets the tape is by going to maddie and threatening her with violence to give the tape to him because she had it i highly disagree i do not think the intention was to ever re reward him i think jules sees it as a possible reward but us the audience knowing how he got it there's no way we are supposed to like oh praise be nate for just holding a gun to your girlfriend's head and threatening to shoot her and then giving the sex tape that you watched of your father and the girl that you catfished and threatened to kill fuck to the girl who is underage in that video there's no way we as the audience are supposed to feel good for him like, the way that it's written, I think we are supposed to. Now, whether you do or not, that's a whole other question, because I definitely didn't. It felt very flat to me. Like, when I was watching it, I was thinking, like, why are they having Nate do this? What is the purpose of this? I feel like this is this is um, silly and doesn't make I think, sense. I think, I, I don't think, I don't know, maybe I'm just jaded, but, like, for me, how I read that was Nate is grasping for control. And who can he have power over in this moment? Because he's about to throw his dad in jail. So who can he have power over at this moment? And he knows that he doesn't have control of his mom. Mm -hmm. He can get control of Jules because he can do this kind thing. Well, we, we'll see uh, if that pans out in season three. You might be right. The way that I felt is we were supposed to like, we were supposed to feel like it was like a mini tiny redemption art for Nate and it didn't land with me. That's how I thought it was supposed to be. So. You are evil, so I hope not. We'll okay. see. We will find are out. We since we yes. Are running low on 
Next. Okay. So for all, right. all of these things that we've talked about, we talked about sobriety, monogamy, hypersexuality, and masculinity. What it all boils down to is that every character in this show has expectations put on them by society, by their families, by the school that they're going to, by their friends, and they all have to live up to those expectations to be considered worthy. And so a lot of the characters end up living essentially double lives, like a, a, a public life that everyone's supposed to see them as and then a private life that only like their close friends or their their significant other gets to see and um and that creates this turmoil within every single one of the characters that manifests in various ways you know in in ways of like drugs and ways of hyper, uh, hypersexuality of cheating of um you know various things like that so that, I think that's what we're all really, what, what all of these things really are, is the pressures that everyone around you is putting on you. And I think we, we see this most with Nate. Mm -hmm. um, Nate is the, and, and it's expectations that his family has put on him, but also expectations that he holds to himself of being, of having that perfect thing all together mm -hmm. that he he knows that he is the monster except if he can fool himself enough to be in denial about being the monster then he doesn't have to confront it and so if he can have the perfect wife which is maddie go, going to be maddie and then turns into cassie and can dress her the perfect way if he can have the perfect you know um the the perfect way that people see him the the college athlete successful business runner that is what he is going to be. That is who he is expected to be. And that is how he's going to do it. And he is going to do it better than his father did it because his father fucking failed. Yeah. His father tried and didn't succeed at all. At, at all. No. And, and he sees it that way. And that is what is pushing him more than anything in this is sitting there and saying like, Hey, I need to go i need to be better than my dad because my dad couldn't fucking pull it together he couldn't stop being gay he couldn't stop failing he couldn't stop cheating on his wife he couldn't stop making me the bad person that i am uh and when that's his whole thing is to get his dad out of the house and as soon as he does uh he realizes that his mother's expectation of him is also terrible <laughs> because his mother sees him for the monster that he is so like it is that that idea of pushing forward of this is the expectations put on by the people who raised me that I have now internalized and need to do. I wish um, Lady cared about my expectations and could be a good kitty. But as y'all know, she's a terror. But we love her anyways. Okay, go lay with, go lay over here. Go lay over there. Um, so yeah, no, I think that Nate, oh God, such a good written character. Um, but I think that he he is the one that is is pushed for expectations. We also see this in McKay, which is why expectations and masculinity, I think, are very similar and go hand in hand. But we see this in Rue with the idea of the expectation of her being sober, of her getting sober that Jules puts on her, of her staying sober, of her eventually overcoming all of this. We see this with Kat, of, especially in the beginning of season two, where she's sitting there and being like, you're supposed to accept your body and I fucking am miserable and hate it. Uh, that idea of like, this is where her fans expect her to be both in the writing and also the people that like, the people who have consumed season one loved Kat's story of overcoming her problems and then like kind of expected that happening in season two and right off the bat breaking the fourth wall, she's basically like, fuck this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a, oh. which is a, one of one of uh, one of Cat's scenes that's actually pretty good in season two, where most of them are pretty garbage. But that seems great. <laughs> yes, but it is again that expectation. So not only is it like the expectations of society within the show, but also the expectations of us, the consumers, putting on these characters mm -hmm. as fans also continually getting the middle finger it's why rue doesn't get sober it's why it's or why her sobriety isn't instantaneous mm -hmm. it's why uh we'll talk about lexi like she finally takes up the mantle and takes power in her own story it's it's why all of these characters really kind of raise a middle finger to all of us fans in that sec second season mm-hmm Yep, absolutely. So that was the um, last topic that we had for this particular episode, but we always ask a question at the end. So Landon, thinking about season one, we'll ask this question for season two next time, but did season one resonate? Yeah, it definitely resonated. 
uh, it resonated in um, a lot of different ways as far as the uh, identification of queerness within the story, um, talking about like overcoming something and then staying in that cycle definitely resonated in that in that degree. Um, I think also for me, someone who has who has loved an addict and uh, being able to see that uh, definitely resonated. Yeah, I hear exactly what you're saying for sure. I hear exactly what you're saying. So I'll have some different comments when it comes to season two, because I think that that one, that's a little bit different. But season one, for me, very much resonated. I identified heavily with a lot of the things that Kat was going through. I identified heavily with a lot of the things that Jules was going through. Um, I I did not identify with Rue, but I have been on the like situation of being like the mom or Gia in that, in like, you know, loving an addict, despite whether you want to or not, and uh, living with one. And so, you know, that in that way, the show very much resonated with me. And I thought that the ensemble cast really is what sold that for season one. And I see why it got so popular. It's not just about how beautiful the show was. It told this very high verisimilitude story because almost every storyline had like a nugget of like realness in there that I think most people could connect with. So yeah, very much, season one very much resonated with me. Hi, Kay. By the way, we are wrapping up. If you know who we should raid into, please let me know. It doesn't look like very many of our friends are online right now. Before you promote drug use. Oh my God. Kay, you're gonna have to go back and watch the beginning of our um, of our uh, stream where we talk about uh, why high school. Um, we don't get into the drug oh, use I, aspect, but we talk about that. I'm so sorry, but if you think that the show promotes drug use, we were watching two very different shows. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, very different shows. Definitely made uh, me not interested in drugs, you know, especially with what man. happens to Rue. Watching Rue, like, not be able to get out of bed and getting a bladder infection because of it. And I know that that also had to do with depression, but it also had to come with coming down. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, also, <laughs> like, being forced to do fentanyl on a knife's edge because scary drug dealer is wanting to hold something against you so that you don't go to the cops. Like, Yeah, I want that. I mean, that I sounds like a fun it. weekend. I I don't need that in my life. Next next time we hang out, Landon, there we go. Plans. Done. We know what we're doing. <laughs> I'll bring the fentanyl. Sweet. Uh, <laughs> I'll find us uh, one. That's for legal purposes. That was a joke. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we want to wrap up? Yeah, let's wrap up. Let's wrap. Can I bring the hookers to do coke off of K? You can absolutely bring the hookers, please. <gasps> And somebody needs to bring the blackjack. Blue, if you, blue, you can come to the party. Bring some blackjack. <laughs> that that word, hookers, was a hundred percent sensitized in my chat on my phone. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> oops. This stream is not Twitch friendly. <laughs> I wonder if YouTube will monetize it. We'll find out, you guys. <laughs> We might, I might have to be deleting the VOD off of Twitch after I, you know, get it all processed and stuff. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> YouTube, come on! All right. All right, Landon, where can where can everybody find you? You can find me on uh, at Land in Maine on Instagram and Twitter. Twitter's been really spicy. I have some hot takes about how fictional characters don't deserve free rights because <laughs> um, they're not because real. <laughs> they're fictional fucking characters. Uh, and also, I've watched season two of Bridgerton twice now in a week and a half, so I have some hot takes on those too. So come come enjoy the hot takes uh on my twitter and also instagram is always fun my cat's cute you can see it on instagram mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep so that's Very where you nice. can find landon i highly do recommend following her twitter it's been great lately also if you would like to support <laughs> landon directly please use her amazon wish list because i have been unsuccessful so far in peer pressuring landon into starting her own stream so that's the best way to support her directly what? Time. <laughs> I know, maybe right? This Maybe this summer. We'll see. We'll see. 
All right, so where can you find me, guys? You can find me right here on Twitch. I uh, stream on Saturdays. That's the show you just watched, Interstage Window, which is a, a group show. I try to stream with friends. So we'll do either something like this, me and Landon will. Sometimes we have guests on. Sometimes we do um, community days where we play a game together, whatever. And then Thursday's stream is my solo stream. That's called Artistic License, where um, I mostly play like simulations and RPGs and stuff like that. So next week on artistic license we are going back to our leaf green nuzlocke we are in part 10 of that nuzlocke we're gonna go get koga um i'm scared but not as scared as i was of sabrina so we'll see we'll see if like this is the end of the nuzlocke i really thought sabrina was going to be but we survived somehow magically and then next week on interstage window we are going to be talking about euphoria more so we're going to be focusing on season two we've got a couple of things so i teased a few things for you guys that we're going to be talking about um we're going to be getting into race when it comes to euphoria we're going to be getting into like what else let me go look at the notes i know that was one thing we're, we're going to talk about my absolute fave my absolute favorite fave fave lexi Mm -hmm. Lexi Angel, Lexi Dream, the person I want to be when I grow up. I love Lexi. Okay. Yes. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, how, you know, everyone seems to have hated season two, but the truth is the problems with season two existed in season one. Okay. So why? So why does everyone hate season two and they didn't hate, hate season one? Interesting question. We're going to answer next week. If you'd like to know the answer, you're going to just have to come back. That's just going to be how it is. <laughs> I'm, holding back. I'm holding back. I have the answer, but I'm holding Don't back. say it. Don't say it. They have to come back next week. Okay. You guys, let's find someone to raid. Let's find someone to raid. Um, <laughs> most of my friends are offline right now. I don't know what's up with that. Why aren't you guys streaming anyway, but Mr. Basilisk is streaming. So we're going to we're going to go into his stream. He is playing some Apex Legends right now. Well, Kay, you're going to have to watch it. Blue, you too. Blue, I think I think we've convinced you that you need to go watch this show. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. good. You know what? If I had it, like, pretty good one. I know that I'm biased, but this, this episode, pretty good. I'm it's pretty, pretty funny. Good. It's pretty good. All right, you guys. So we are going to raid into Mr. Boss Lisk. All right. We're giving you just two more seconds. And then here we go, you guys. See you later. Bye.